Welcome back to part 3 of the Final Fantasy IV PC speedrun. We'll now head back to Toya to get the Bard Song augment from Edward. Even though this is optional, there is one Bard Song that is absurdly useful which we'll learn much later on. We'll then go return the crystal to the Epops, but Golbus contacts us and demands we give him the crystal in exchange for Rosa. We'll listen to his demands and go see Kane on the airship who brings us to the Tower of Zot, located somewhere in the air I guess? After traversing the dungeon, we'll eventually meet the Maga Sisters, who are the next Archfiend Barbaricia servants. The Maga Sisters are the only bosses in the game immune to slow, so we will have to deal with their fast turns. Maga Sisters pattern is that the left sister Sandy will cast Reflect on the middle sister Cindy, then the right sister Mindy casts a random black magic on Cindy to bounce it back at us, followed by Cindy attacking us, so we'll have to get around that. Just like with Dark Elf, we can silence the tall sister to cut out the reflect, but it's a bit unreliable so instead we'll just kill her at the start with Cecil crying, Yang attacking, and missing. Followed by Tella using Faraga and Dandara, and then have a Yang hit without missing to kill her. We'll then have Yang build a focus stack to attack the middle sister who's much tankier while Tella dispels the reflect and uses Osmos to restore MP. If Sid is alive, he'd kill himself to give everyone else experience since Sid's completely useless in the run. Next round, Tello will use a double Faraga on both sisters while Yang attacks the middle sister. Cecil will then kill Yang to take his experience. Oh. Yang will kill himself to give away the exp- Yang, stop missing! Cecil will kill Yang to take all of his experience while Tello kills with a Blazaga on both sisters. We need to heal the party, but since we're low on ethers, we'll just pop a tent instead. This is a tent glitch. While there's a usable item next to an unusable item like a tent, you can select the usable item and quickly move the cursor to the tent with a slight delay which lets you use it like an item. In the case of tents, they restore HP and MP and also remove status effects from a single party member no differently than you would use this outside but for one person only. Cottages become an elixir plus remedy combo as they fully heal HP and MP and remove status effects as well. This does include a reverse which means you have to be careful of when you use it. Other uses include alarm clocks inflicting sleep, as ironic as that is, crosses inflicting curse, gear and weapons getting deleted, and key items crashing the game so hard you have to control alt delete to open task manager to close the game. We now meet up with a big bad Golbez to exchange a crystal for Rosa, but he plays dumb after. Tella fights Golbez and gives up his life to cast Meteor, but it's all for naught as Golbez is still alive, but it does unbrainwash King for us. We'll grab the few augments that Tella drops and then go rescue Rosa in the next room. This is now a good time to spread around our augments. We'll give Twin Caster Cecil and Rosa as well as Recall and Last Stand to Sid. Sid's final augment is really good, so we gave the two garbage augments from Tella to him. Cecil and Rosa got Twin Cast without they have an actual way to deal damage instead of passively standing by. Now we're on to the third Archfiend Barbaricia. Yang will be a good source of damage, though we now have another good source of damage. Barbaricia usually goes into tornado form, though she occasionally chooses not to which can mess things up. This makes her immune to all melee attacks except jump, which is what cancels this form. So Kane starts with a jump while Cecil cries and Rosa casts slow to make her less aggressive. Yang meanwhile starts stacking on focus. Sid's going to kill himself again and Cecil and Rosa will start twin casting. While Talon and Porum cast Comet at 100% sync, Cecil and Rosa are actually a unique pair. The two of them together cast the spell Ultima, which is the most powerful spell in the game with a spell power of 999, which is 4 times more powerful than Meteor, sitting at 250 spell power, letting them deal a massive amount of damage despite Cecil's low intellect stats. The drawback is that it costs 99 MP from both Cecil and Rosa to cast, and requires 100% stink, so we can only use it once per fight, but it's absurdly powerful. Depending on the damage roll we get, Yang will either do a third focus or just attack right away to knock out most of Barbarisha's health. As long as Yang doesn't miss, Barbarisha will either die now or after Kane does one more attack. On the off chance Yang misses, well, have fun recovering. The tower begins to collapse, so Rosa will save us by casting Teleport to bring us all the way to Cecil's room. So I guess his Tower of Zod is hidden somewhere in Cecil's room? After a good night's sleep, we'll fly to Agar to find Cheating Wei who has now come clean and become Putting Wei the Naive. He asks us for a Remo Pudding of all things and expects us to give it to him for free even though this thing sells for 100,000 gil and normally takes a few hundred hours of your life to find. But yes, we'll just give it to him and he'll run off to who knows where. Now we can toss a magma stone down a well which opens a hole to the underworld for us to go down. Down underground, our airship gets attacked and we crash land near the Dwarven Castle where we meet the Dwarven King. Sid leaves and Yang senses an evil presence in the Crystal Chamber where we fight a group of dolls. I'm sure you remember all these bastards, right? Killing a few of them causes them to fuse together into Calcabrina. 
but we can just toss two blue things to kill all of them before they fuse and end the fight immediately. Now we have to face Golbuzz again, but this time he ran out of old people to sacrifice, so we gotta fight him for real. After a little bit, Golbuzz will paralyze the entire party and kill everyone except Cecil. In older games, it was possible to just have Kane jump to keep him alive for the next phase, but the devs thought that and scripted Golbuzz to wait for Kane to land on the ground before casting Cold Bind, which is why we'll be abusing that mechanic instead. Cecil and Rosa will start twin casting right away, and Kane will then jump at about 30% of the way into the cast to give Cecil and Rosa enough time to cast Ultima. Yang will kill Rosa to cut out one animation later, and then Kane will land, causing Golbuzz to paralyze everyone and kill them one by one with Black Fang. Before he can kill Cecil, a Mist Dragon appears and kills a Black Dragon as well as dealing a good amount of damage to Golbez, which drops him down to 1 HP as he's unkillable until the next phase. A mysterious girl in green joins us, so now we wait and see what Golbez does. If he uses Drain, Mr. Gilder will cast Bio. Otherwise, she'll cast Chocobo, which is slightly faster. He could also have Ridi attack, but her accuracy isn't that high, so it's a huge risk for just a split second of time save. Cecil, meanwhile, has a Holy Sword which gets absorbed thanks to Golbez's Barrier Shift gimmick. There are technically ways around it, but because we replaced attack with twin cast for Cecil, there's nothing that's worth the time. We learned that the mystery girl is Rydia, the little girl who was with us at the start. She was in the Fame March, which is the land of the Eidolons, and she aged a few years because time flows weirdly there. While we're all distracted, Golbez steals a crystal and escapes, so now we need to help the dwarves attack Golbez's lair. We get the draw attacks augment from the Dwarven King and then use the time to give bluff to Rydia and draw attacks to Kane. Bluff when used doubles the caster's intellect, so it'll double Rydia's black magic or boost her summon magic by about 60% or so since summons use the average of intellect and spirit for damage calculations. Meanwhile, draw attacks just forces all enemies to target Kane to keep everyone else in the party safe. While you probably want to put this on Cecil casually since he's kinda the tank and all, since we're twin casting with Cecil and Rosa on many of the bosses, we want to keep Cecil from taking any damage, so Kane is one of the better options for this. We'll also go around looting stuff from the castle to get an elixir, a dwarven axe, another elixir, and a power armlet, and then go find Pudding Wei in the pub who has now become Moping Wei the Pathetic, because his girlfriend cheated on him. Ha! Karma's a bitch, isn't it? Rydia will whip him into shape, which snaps him out of his oppression, so he'll give us the eye gouge augment, which is pretty useless, just like naming Wei himself. With everything set, the party's going to travel into enemy territory to steal back the crystals, and inside the tower, we encounter this mad scientist and his robots. This fight is more or less a comedy routine, if anything. Luke will talk in combat, but the dialogue pauses ATB, so we'll have Yang toss a spare spider silk at them to stop them from wasting our time. Meanwhile, Radio will cast Rama while Cecil and Rosa twin cast to take them out before they get the chance to speak again. Luke gets mad at us for destroying his precious robot, so he'll transform into this weird robot thing and come at us seriously with his reversal gas, which is where the reverse status effect comes from. This fight here is extremely annoying, but what we want to do is kill Dr. Luke with two elixir tosses. However, he also has a chance to use a reversal gas a second time which means an elixir would just heal him, messing with the fight. If he does remove reversal gas, then we can have Rydia summon Rama once to deal some damage and cut out one of the elixirs, but we have to just wait for Luge to reverse us an odd number of times to get in the last elixir. Before Luge dies, he tells us about how the dwarves are in trouble so we'll have to go and rescue them. We'll find some goblin captains operating the turrets whom we will take down with Rydia casting Rama. Before the enemies disappear, they make the machines go haywire, so Yang saves everyone by taking the rest of the party out of the room and destroying the machines, causing a big explosion inside. We'll escape the tower and then fall onto Sid's airship which she finished repairing. We'll head back to the surface, but along the way we get chased by an enemy airship, so Sid sacrifices himself by blowing up a bomb to block off the exit to the surface world. We need to get back into the tower to steal back the crystals. So we'll do so by getting our airship upgraded by Sid's lackeys and then steal Edward's hovercraft while he's not around so we can enter the Eblon cave where the Eblonese have hidden themselves. As an optional bit of safety, we can buy some shurikens, though recent route changes have managed to cut this out entirely in exchange for some decently favorable damage rolls. Deeper inside the cave, we find this dumbass ninja who tries to use fire and magic on a fire monster and have him join our party. We'll now just take away some of his gear and give Kane the power armlet, black belt G, and the headband to boost his strength by 15, as well as giving Rydia the green beret to boost her HP by 200. At the end of the cave is the Tower of Babel, so we'll casually go inside and reach the end to find Edge's parents who are believed to be dead. Instead, they've actually been turned into monsters! So now we have to fight them, except not really because all we really need to do is defend with the whole party and wait this out. After a while, the king and queen regain their senses so they'll say their goodbyes, by the way, in case you didn't know, Edge's real name is Edward, so you know who the king and queen remind me of? Edward.
After a very sad scene of Edge grieving over his parents' death, we finally get to fight the final Archfiend, Ruby Kante. Ruby Kante has two different stances. He starts off by flashing the entire party, which means he's getting ready for a big attack, Inferno, which does massive AoE damage to the entire party. However, while his cape's open, he's also weak to ice. Meanwhile, if his cape's closed, he absorbs ice, so we can't have Rydia cast Shiva, which is our biggest source of damage. So we need to keep his cape open as long as possible while also staying safe. So we'll start the fight with Edge stealing from him to force him to close up his cape. I don't know why the developers made that a mechanic, but stealing is what forces him to open or close his cape. Now, because his cape's closed, we fought ourselves more time before he casts Inferno, so we'll spend some time setting things up for later by having Cecil cry, Rosa cast slow, and Rydia using bluff. We'll then have Rosa cast shell on Rydia to keep her safe. Now that Ruby's cape is open and everything's set up, Rydia will cast Shiva to deal some damage and also force a counter from Ruby Kante where he damages himself with Blazara. Cecil and Rosa will then use Ultima, which gets Ruby really low. Rydia will also use another bluff and then quickly defend before Ruby casts Inferno, which kills off the entire party minus Rydia, who just barely survives thanks to the Green Beret. Rydia then ends the fight alone and gets the full 120,000 experience, which makes her gain 6 whole levels. Why are we giving her all the experience? Well, you'll have to find out next time.